I'm Tammy Lee Meyer, and it is my honor and pleasure to be with Stephanie Rerick, uh, who, as well as being an incredible musician, is uh, a founder and leader in the movement of uh, new economy doers, and has started something called the Mutual Aid Network, or HUMAN now, as I understand. Um, Stephanie, I'd love to just jump in and ask what, what, Let's start with what a mutual aid network is, and then we'll lean into what brought you there. All right, great. So a mutual aid network, first of all, um, it's, it's a network of organisms, beings helping one another out. So we didn't invent mutual aid networks, of course, as a actual thing, and they exist throughout the natural world all the time. Um, and we created a type of mutual aid network that we, that we capitalize as um, it is a new type of networked cooperative um, that's designed to create means for everyone to discover and succeed in work they want to do with the support of their community. So that's sort of the big vision behind it. Um, and what it really is, is taking a lot of methodologies that people have been using throughout human history, um, combined with some new understandings, uh, deliberate uh, way of attaching values and principles to how we do things, a deliberate way of governing ourselves, a deliberate way of um, applying different sorts of sharing and resource exchange to uh, create opportunity for everyone to have their best possible life here on the planet. Um, and so essentially what you do is you create a mutual aid network, which is a type of cooperative around any kind of purpose. It can be about supporting the people who are part of it. And then you use, you steward together um, time banking, so exchanging time instead of money. So my hour is worth the same amount as your hour of help. And so um, this way we can connect uh, to support each other with the kinds of work that are very abundant. So they're not valued in the market economy for a lot of stupid reasons, but care, creativity, civic engagement, and community work are all really well facilitated through time banking. Um, but then also building more just outright shared resources. So here we're looking to create a library of things and um, some commons gardens that people can just help themselves to. Um, and shared laundry facilities, for example. But also you could look at something like a maker space or we've opened a co-working and collaboration space here. So now because we're sharing some infrastructure, building space, equipment, um, some administrative capacity, so it takes, you know, makes it easier, creates more abundance for all the participants. Um, but then we'll also, um, we also are working with a, a model that a lot of people think of as savings pools or revolving loan funds or gift circles, so ways of pooling money. So essentially you have these different ways that you develop and steward your resources more wisely. And because you're doing that, you're taking the pressure off to go and earn a bunch of your own money in the exploitative economy. So you can start displacing some of your activity from going and working in a situation that's exploiting you or your community or your planet and replace it with activity that's nourishing you, your community and your planet. You're being compensated for that with, the, with resources from other people in your community. So it's really a do it ourselves method of creating economic justice and community resilience. And I see it as um, on one hand kind of hiring each other to create the new economy and create the new world that we want to live in. And I also see it as a, yeah, it's, it's just, um, it's a way that we redesign the global economy by redesigning our own work lives and those of people in our networks. So we invite people in based on their strengths and interests. And then the way we are set up is really designed to grow and spread organically. So we have different partner projects in different places around the world. Um, and each of us is working in our own way on our own goals. And we're connecting across our locations to share knowledge, share materials, share material resources. And um, so we create networks of real trust in our locations that create the networks of real trust between our locations because we actually get to know each other or by proxy get to know some of each other. And we're looking to create a neighborly global economy based on actual trust. Yes. 
And we can do it. <laughs> and are. Um, yeah, we are doing it. Yes. And what got you started? Um, what got me started is I have always been drawn to things that are not <laughs> aren't aren't uh, very embraced by the market economy. So right. when I was um, first like coming into the workforce, or when I was like first between high school and college, I got involved in Amnesty International. One of my earlier jobs, I was working for Greenpeace Environmental Organization. I ended up sort of happening into being a co-owner of a small local coffee shop. I do music. Um, I call it original, independent, unpopular music, um, and uh, and and have been involved in social and economic justice stuff. So, um, especially since I've been living in Wisconsin, in Madison, Wisconsin, focused on the mass incarceration problem that we have in our country and the racial disparities and racism that's inherent in it. And so at a certain point, I realized that the economy is the, as it is, is the enemy of every single one of those things, pushes every single one of those things in the wrong direction. So I realized that there is an underpinning, there's a missing link here. And I needed to look at that underlying economic missing link. Um, and I did, I ended up picking up a book called The Future of Money by a hero of mine who recently passed, Bernard Leotard. So that's one of the deaths of someone very dear, important to me, um, and honored to be helping carry on his work. But in his book, The Future of Money, he laid out different ways that people have approached sharing and exchange through different points of human history, um, including now. And all of a sudden, I had hope for the future for the first time in my adult life. Um, I realized it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, it really has virtually never been this way. I think it's really important to back up our view and look at all of human history. And it's not the whole world is operating in this hyper capitalistic mode still. And it's still a very recent human invention or, and it's not even an invention. Some of it's mistakes that have happened. Some of it's been invented, but a very recent, this sort of like global capitalism eating everything. Um, so we don't need to assume it's the natural order and we don't need to assume this is the best we can do. And we can see tons of examples of when we've done better or people who are currently doing better. And when was this, when was this moment of realization? That was in 2004. Um, and it wasn't the first it, you know, I, I actually helped start a local currency here back in 1995. Wasn't the first time I realized there's a problem with capitalism. Um, and it wasn't the first time I'd been like involved in related things. But it was the epiphany of like how we, how this could happen. I felt like that book showed me it can happen. Not only can it happen, it has happened, but how it can happen now. And, um, and then I've taken different steps toward that started a time bank in 2005. That's why I started the time bank at that time. Um, started a time bank then, and then in 2010 started like a research and development project about how to flesh out the vision, which is then what turned into mutual aid networks. Part of why we call it mutual aid networks is it very much describes the thing we're making, but also in the United States, we have the phrase working for the man. So if you're being oppressed, working at a dumb corporate job, you're working for the man. So we want to be the new, the man, like our aim yes. is to take it over, co-opt all this stuff. We'll do the co-op thing this time. So we're, we're a type of cooperative, which is essentially a corporation. This country has given it all over to the corporation, hook, you know, totally wholesale, corporate control, corporate deregulation. We're a form of corporation. So let's compete and win. So we'll compete and we'll win because we're going to make it a lot more fun. We're going to invite everybody to play. Um, and then you mentioned the humans, so we're mutual aid networks, and then we're joined in a global cooperative network that we call the humans. So we used to call it the main man, but then we got so sick of the main man <laughs> in every way. And so we <laughs> to the humans, so humans united in mutual aid networks is the global, global cooperative open for membership. Anyone can join. And that's the aim is to just, if you have a dream, in your neighborhood, whether you know anyone there or not yet, 
we, we can help connect you with ways to find the other people around you. We can help you be, help you access the person in the world with the most experience that we can find in that. that that's the idea is like really connect. There are plenty of people who've been thinking and working very and writing very deeply about these issues but don't have a local community for one reason or another, connect them and their thinking with other people who want to try out their ideas. So there was an example that you shared with me a few years ago about this, this, uh, the part about mass incarcer incarceration and working with youth. And I wondered if you can, you can share that particular example of a mutual aid network in action. Yeah. So, um, so this mutual aid network, or the whole concept of, of this form of mutual aid networks grew out of the Dane County Time Bank. So that's the Time Bank that I founded in 2005 after reading this book. Um, when we created the Time Bank, um, it was with an eye toward you know, this, uh, I kind of want to back up, like one of the things when I was active in the mass incarceration, we were focused a lot on drug policy. Um, and a number of our public officials would say, you, you, the, the, all the research shows that uh, pro-social networks, economic, educational, social, um, recreational opportunity is what keeps people um, out of trouble in general in the criminal system. And then, they, and then the law enforcement side of it would say, there aren't resources for that, so this is what happens. And sometimes the only way you can get someone into treatment is to put them into the criminal system. So I believe that's wrong, and that's not something we should settle for, and hadn't really had a clear picture of how you could really focus on the building, the intact community side, Till I learned about time banking, I learned there was a time bank youth court in Washington, D.C. And I realized with time banking, first of all, you can invite people in to work on this problem um, because they can put their time and talents toward it. Um, so you can do some things without necessarily having to get a giant pot of money to pay a bunch of people to do them. But then also the time banking piece itself helps to reweave the social fabric. Um, and also uh, when you have a time bank, so in our time bank we have um, 3,000 members who've ever participated in our time bank. And um, so that's a whole huge variety of skills and resources. Um, so there's something in juvenile justice that they refer to as responsivity. So the more responsive you can be, and it, essentially it means treating the child, the young person like an individual human being, but the more you can be actually responsive to their very needs and strengths, um, the better they do. So with 3,000 members with a variety of skills and talents, we can be quite responsive. Um, so, so we started the Time Bank with an eye to starting a Time Bank supported youth court, and then we did that, and it worked really well. Um, ended up going from one tiny neighborhood into all the high schools, into now our police department in the city is referring every young person between the ages of 12 and 16, if they're getting ticketed by a city police officer, they can choose to come to a restorative justice option. And now it's spreading into young, there's a young adults peer court too, there's a homelessness restorative justice project. Like as people in the system see how it works, um, it's, it's gaining its own momentum. Like there's no denying, no, no one can deny that we have a big problem here with mass incarceration and a school to prison pipeline. And there are a lot of eyes on that and there haven't been many things proposed that have really helped to turn things around. And this is helping to shift um, and it's helping build a lot of relationships and a lot of perspectives that help lead to deeper and deeper work. Um, and it's building a community among the young people, uh, being very solution oriented, building compassion and empathy, but building sort of more systems, awareness and literacy. Um, so that's all done under the auspices of the Dane County Time Bank and partners. And the way we build on the time banking piece and the mutual aid network piece is 
um, we have an intention um, to start working with some of the youth that we've been building re relationships with to move more into like identifying proactive things for the community, for the youth, for proactive um, for the community can be something that's about we need an enterprise that creates gainful employment here. So we want to be able to just sort of build on this expanding integration across these different um, disciplines and different communities, build on that to like really build into uh, build capacity for a whole healthy ecosystem in every every way <laughs> healthy ecosystem economically environmentally you know and socially what what i love about what i remember you telling me is so the the kids are a part of a a group that co that are peer counselors for each other and so that time is counted as time into the time bank and then they can take out time from the 3000 other members. So if they want drum lessons or sewing lessons or, uh, you know, tutoring, transportation, a couple of young people have been looking for Korean tutors, which we haven't been able to supply it. So, I mean that for me, what's incredible about that is that a, they get to be in control of their own, choices that they're making so they 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 get empowered just by participating and then they can also uh, what you talked about was the weaving of all of the relationships in the community so that responsiveness is not just at one layer it's like multi-generational and you know there are people i'm sure there are stories of kids who one of those connections have changed their lives completely mm -hmm. yeah and actually um both of the staff for the Time Bank Youth Court, um, we met them as high school jurors years ago, and the, now they're running the youth court program. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a, again, just the whole shift in perspective that people have. And it happens with time banking a lot in general. The, the shift of perspective from lack to potential, um, and the shift in perspective from, uh, you did something against the system to we be accountable to each other to create a healthy, peaceful environment for each other in the school, in the neighborhood. Um, so yeah, all those things. I think that's the biggest power of time banking. And for me in mutual aid networks, time banking is always an important piece for us. And it doesn't have to be like called that. It doesn't have to be operating in a particular system. But the aspect of time banking that's so important to me is it boils it down into people, uh, resources, and the flows, and um, doesn't allow for any discrepancy in how people's time is valued. And a lot of times people have that as they, their big objection or concern about time banking at first, including I, I also had that. I was like, not excited about the everyone's hour being valued equally when I was starting the time bank, just because I saw ways that we couldn't use time banking then. But the thing that's beautiful about it and the thing that I think is food for thought is maybe catalog in your mind the good reasons for uh, valuing people's time differently. So your thing might be very physically demanding, so you can't do that much of it. Or maybe you had to pay a lot of money to go get trained and you need to make that back. Um, and, and there are probably a few more. Now let's catalog, catalog all the terrible reasons people's time is valued differently. Your race, your attractiveness, your gender, your immigration status, the fact that our society doesn't value taking care of people who are disabled, but we do value sports. Um, the fact that we value making weapons and we don't value. So, um, just the aspect of boiling it down and and having I mean it's sort of yeah and and just even looking at any of that through any sort of lens I think is really healthy and then that creates an experiential learning tool and creates sort of a more fertile ground from which to grow your and create some good habits in terms of working together understanding what each other's assets are um, and then helps create a fertile ground um, from which to grow sort of the more complicated economic functions. So for us, that would be setting up a common fund 
where we pool our money, pool our savings and make a revolving loan at no interest to different members or, you know, or creating an enterprise together or creating a kind of mutual credit that's going to have more stringent rules because it's, you know, it's, it's connected to money. Does that make sense? It does. And what I, what I love about it is that it's, it's based on our human needs and what, and, and it's also entering an, a really important question and conversation that we all need to have around value and how value is determined. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a, that's a place where, where we need to look, we need to have deep conversations and we need to, we need to flip the script on it. So yeah. I love what you're doing. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And, and, um, so it's, I have thought my eyes were open in so many different points of my life where then all of a sudden they get opened and I'm like, well, how, how could they have been that closed? But I, I feel like even more recently, I've just like, just have more insights on that just by like being able to live in this, in the, in this world more, I have more of these conversations, but yeah, it was just even like, everyone's go-to is the doctors and lawyers like, wow, but what about doctors and lawyers? And then maybe that is the best example because lawyers are now, you know, being more concerned about de being displaced by artificial intelligence. Um, and doctors, my understanding is doctors in Cuba um, get, they make a, an average salary and provide house calls and um, more access to healthcare than we tend to have in this country. Um, yeah, anyhow, we could go on that tangent for a long time. So I'll leave it there and invite you to go on that tangent, anyone who's paying attention to this yourself. <laughs> Do you have any, uh, any mutual aid networks that are international? That, oh, yeah. that are, you mean operating across, across national boundaries yes. together? Mm -hmm. So, um, Let's see. So we have mutual aid networks in individual places uh, and, and in different countries. So in the UK and South Africa, our, the humans is a mutual aid network that is, you know, we are a mutual aid network that's international. There's no legal structure for an international co-op. So we're a U.S. incorporated co-op with global membership. So, so the answer is, is yes. Um, what we expect is that a mutual aid network is a community, but it could be a community of practice or a community of place or a community of relationship. So, um, so besides the humans, there's one that was floated that didn't come to reality yet, but actually we'll see some of the people in Vancouver when we come to visit you. Um, there was one that was considering forming that was a number of young women artists who were scattered around the world and they wanted to make one that was for their good livelihood, which would be a great application of it. So yes, um, what it just, as, so it's, it's early stages of this experiment, but from what I know and I've observed and have guessed, I'm expecting that we will generally be more successful when it comes together around a community of practice or a community of place. And um, that, it might be like a lot of other efforts um, where if you go beyond a sort of critical mass that enables you to stay connected, you will need to figure out nodes of connection and motivation within that. So it's never been our goal to grow one giant thing. It's always been our goal to have a lot of different size things that network into a giant networked thing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> a giant networked th like not networked thing networked things giant networked things <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so one of the projects that i've been working with over the last couple of years is uh, a collection of people from all over the world that are looking at global challenges and how we might respond to those so one of the questions that i have is is it required as a mutual aid network to be incorporated somewhere it is not so as a community of practice, for example, of people that are, that are meeting, discussing, distilling ideas and engaging people, it's not required. You are welcome. Um, we made a loose, a little definition, I guess it's not loose, because we, we wanted to like formalize a little bit, but 
a project can be three people, like two or three people. And um, part of what we want is for people to, so uh, part of our initial vision, first of all, is like lower the barriers to doing cool stuff in your, wherever you want, and then raise people's capacity to cross the barriers that are still there. One of the barriers is having to have so much organizational structure and then administer your organization. So we have the perspective um, that it's good if people can keep their organization non-existent or very light. And part of the reason we want to have solid organizational structures ourselves is someone could operate under, under the umbrella of the humans for a particular reason, or we can connect someone with a fiscal sponsor, or um, or they can be part of the Madison Mutual Aid Network, be a project of it. And then we have we have a lawyer here who we work with, and other people bring their own sort of um, friends and contacts that they have with the legal expertise. But our lawyer suggested you'll know when it's t when you need your own organization, when you need to sign a contract, when you want to start paying rent. Like at a certain point, it will become cumbersome to have the other organization help you. So that's that's how it is. So yes, everyone's welcome. Um, what we what we really care about is abiding by the core principles and you know um so the core principles are drawn from time banking principles and commons governance principles and cooperative principles and i like to believe it's kind of like distilled down to the golden rule but there's like really specific things mutual aid among mutual aid networks we help each other out um uh we value all kinds of work um, everyone's value. So all these basic things about respect and mutual support and you can't discriminate. We, you know, uh, so there, there are just some various, various um, aspects of following the core principles that I'm talking very windily about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that is the core though. I mean, there needs to be a core because this can go anywhere. Yes. Right. And so I think that it's it is really important to have those really clear principles to to be able to uh, express the values of what it actually is. So, yeah. Awesome. All of it's laid out at mutualaidnetwork.org. And then also people can um, join the global co-op there. They can uh, look into becoming a pilot site or we'll probably change that terminology soon to partner projects because we're getting a little beyond pilot phase, but we want partner projects everywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I have another direction. So you, you might recall that I have been working on a project called the Alphabet Code. Yes. Yes. And so that's getting closer. And oh. I wanted to pick your brain about that because it is a, um, it could be a business, mm -hmm. but I'm not that person. Uh, and and it is something that's separate from me. So I was looking for a way to have it be a uh, a collective project in a way. So without people knowing about the alphabet code, it isn't anything. So people's time and attention invested in learning about the alphabet code is of value. That's for a start. Mm -hmm. um, and it itself is a value and it's a thing that's a separate thing from a human being. So I'm looking for a way to be able to uh, express something of value that's a non-human entity mm -hmm. um, that can be of benefit. It's an of benefit type of entity. And I don't know if there's anything like that, but I wanted to plant that in your brain to see what thoughts you might have on how I might... Um, create it as a type of, uh, well, I've, I've, I've been using the term decorporation. So rather than an incorporation, a decorporation, yeah. and that human beings would have the capacity to do that. And that things like the alphabet code would be able to also be a decorporation. Um, and that is in service of really looking at what a corporation is and what the next kind of corporation, considering the state of the world today and what's happening in, in, in the corporation crushing the life out of us. Yes. 
um, how do we create new frameworks that can hold a non-human entity? So, thoughts. So are you thinking a decorporation would be like an un, actually unincorporated thing that you'd have sort of guidelines about how it operates? Yes. Oh, that's cool. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so, um, but I don't see why, you, I, I, I don't know if there are like legal restrictions on what you call a corporation, mm -hmm. but, I, but you can often get around those through clever spelling and punctuation anyhow. I think it's a cool idea and it, it uh, yeah. Um, I guess that would be sort of like what our lawyer would say is like, I guess you would see when you run into the barriers, um, you, people would be voluntarily signing on to agreements about how they work together, but the, everything's voluntary anyway, you know, yes. it's, it's not like having a real corporation protects you from people violating agreements. Agreed. So, I think it sounds good and, and um, you know, so this is off the top of my head without this being really my area of expertise, but this would be a circumstance where we would want to be able to be a resource for you. Um, right. We have the humans cooperative and you need a cooperative to, you know, you need a cooperative umbrella to submit an application under, we could be that or, you yep. know, whatever, whatever is needed for that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it might be that the alpha get bet code as a project could be a project of the human, the humans yeah, network could with, without any other, yeah, you could do that today and we'd be happy to have you. That would be exciting because there's already people working on it and contributing their time. And I'd love to be able to track that and really yeah. generate value. Um, and I'm just opening it up to people to read and contribute. So that is awesome. Yes. Cool. So some of the, when we were talking about what is a mutual aid network, I was talking about sort of the, the resource tools that we're planning to use. And again, you can find this all at mutualaidnetwork.org. But the parts that I think we bring to the party in a unique way are, um, we're really focused on sort of the social change community organizing and um, facilitation tools that help people use those resource sharing tools and make it real. And, um, and so, so like some of what we're talking about is some of that stuff, like helping to uh, identify and share good models for governance. Um, and uh, the pro being a project of the mutual aid network, then you can use our, um, at any member of the mutual of humans can use our project management software. Um, so we're looking to really integrate and we have a technical component to our work um, where we're looking to create an open source ecosystem of different software and communication tools to really integrate our social and economic networks. So right now, I mean, we have a sort of a rough draft of everything we need and we're working on connecting things. Um, there's plenty of work to be done, so don't get me wrong about that. Um, and there's plenty of functionality that's not like all smooth, but we have a mutual aid platform that we use and um, it has some really nice project management tools that we're using and um, a goal of having more cool like-minded projects on it is we can see each other and we can see what each other has done to create our project to make it a lot easier. So we're sharing knowledge and resources on there, but then also you can manage your project on there. People can do tasks. You can um, assign as very, uh, very serious workflow oriented actually. Um, but then when some, someone does a task, they can say the amount of time it took to do it and we can log that time against the project and get hours in a person's account so we can start time banking to run our projects as we go and then also that's there's a marketplace resource sharing platform attached to it so that really is the idea is like get this form of more cooperative resource sharing and exchange make it really easy and smooth for people to do it make it really integrated with our work lives as they wish as we wish them to be like I want my work life to consist of some of my professional skills, more of my creative skills, more of my community work skills, you know, and, and just shift the balance there. So what's my first step? Your first step as Tammy would be to, I think you're already in the humans as a member. 
I know. Um, and then connect with me and do an orientation and get you in the humans as a project. So um, we regularly, so when people join the humans, they get just a very basic level of permissions in the software. And then we want to do an orientation with people and then up your permissions so you can access the whole back end project management stuff. And then we also support each other very much in, we have a pilot site meetups uh, uh, twice a month online. And um, what the topic, well, the topic shift depending on what people need, but we're very interested in supporting each other and learning from each other about how to do good outreach and visioning and role selection in local communities and how to govern our work and how to um, govern the resources that we're doing. So that would be the next step is, is um, to join us during pilot site meetups and or join that project in the map so you can read the notes afterward. We really like aim to make everything very transparent and accessible. Awesome. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm really excited in particular with the alphabet code, but also with the um, global challenges collaboration because they're both, um, they'll both have different entry points into this. Mm -hmm. And with the Global Challenges Collaboration, there are some incredible humans there. And so I'm really excited about, about though, that cohort of people really knowing more about mutual aid net networks, because you never know what kind of ripples can happen from that. Me too. Things really feel ripe right now in, in every way and everything I'm involved in, it seems like this is happening. And with everyone I know that... Um, People, people came together, actually a lot of it was three years, you know, I guess it's almost four years since I met you, but people came together years ago, um, think, you know, on a very, we're all on, on very ambitious timelines, but for many of us, it has been like a slog behind the scenes. Many people got taken away to take care of their own or family members' health problems. I broke one arm, then injured another arm, and, and then... Recently, in the last like four months, everyone's coming back together all at once. And sometimes it's people we worked together 30 years ago, 20, 25, 15, 10, 5. So it's really beautiful and it's time and everybody knows it. We can tell we're in danger also. Yes. And there's a ton of uh, hope and opportunity and yeah, I, a long time ago, I was going to call a paper this, but the missing linking, I'm like, it's not the link that's missing. The linking is missing, the missing linking. So we're finding the missing linking this year. Awesome. Well, this is one step towards that. Totally. Yeah. I'm Stephanie. I'm really excited for our visits. Yes. 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 In the Vancouver area. Yes. Thank you so much for this time. Maybe we can have a quick checkout after I stop record. Um, but I really love what you've done over the years and I love how it's maturing and really creating these opportunities for people to take back their power and share and live the new economy. So thank you. Thank you.